Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Katie Starr and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage marketing team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is a family owned business located in Southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're here to serve you and your animals with consistent, high quality nutrition and valuable education to keep them happy and healthy. Welcome to our educational webinar titled, What Type of Hay Should I Feed My Horse? Pros and Cons of Alfalfa, Timothy, Teff, Orchard, and Bermuda. There are a lot of varieties of hay to choose from when feeding your horses and other livestock, but how do you know what's right? Is your horse too fat or maybe too thin? The type of hay they are eating matters, and it depends on their age, activity level, and whether they are plagued with any medical issues. So we're here to talk about it. And as I have mentioned in our previous webinar, with past feedback, attendees have requested that we go longer if that means that we get more time in for questions. We have a lot to cover today, so there's a possibility that we could go over our time. And instead of rushing through, leaving out information or cutting short Q&A time, we want to be able to give you as much information as we can. If you don't like it, or if you do like it, just let us know in the follow-up survey. If you happen to be new to joining our webinars, we'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. If you're viewing this as a recording, feel free to skip over this section. As a heads up, we will have a few poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have the opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Depending on how many questions come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached three files associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. One that is shown here is a quick fact sheet that covers a few of the different types of forage and what they are recommended for. Another is a white paper that provides an overview of the four questions we'll talk about today that help us to understand what forage type is best for your horse. And lastly, an additional nutritional white paper on managing body condition with forage. For those of you that are viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the quick fact sheet that's titled, What Type of Forage Should I Feed My Horse? And then the two white papers, Managing Body Condition with Forage and What is the Right Kind of Forage for Your Horse? And that quick fact sheet will be under um, a category that's called infographics. So our educational content is tucked in here on the website and I wanted to actually show you a screenshot of our website where you can find some of the helpful educational content that we have here under nutritional resources. So that includes all of our past webinars that we've recorded and other nutritional white papers and more. And that is all I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage equine nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share a little more about herself before she begins the presentation. 
Thanks, Katie, and thank you all for getting on. I'm really excited about this topic tonight. It's something that I get a lot of questions about in my day-to-day -day, uh, work when I'm on farms, chatting with customers. Uh, we talk about feed and supplements, but really the hay is the largest part of the horse's diet, and I know we have a lot of choices, or sometimes we're limited on our choices. So <clears throat> what are the pros and cons of all of these hays? I'm, I, I, as Katie said, we're really excited to talk about this. If you notice, I've got a bit of a funny accent. I'm originally from Australia, and I have been in America quite a while now. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started. Um, in order to determine what is the most appropriate hay for your horse, you've got to ask several questions. And the first question is, what is the age of your horse? Is it a young growing horse <clears throat> or a senior horse? All those horses that kind of sit in that middle mature age category, we ask another question of those, and that is what is the physiological stage? Are they breeding, lactating? Are they stallions? Or what's the use of the horse? Are they exercising light, moderate, heavy exercise, just a maintenance horse, et cetera? Um, we also look at the discipline that they're doing. Has your horse been diagnosed with any relevant medical issues that might deter might dictate their nutritional requirements, i.e., is it HYPP and we've got to be concerned about potassium, or is it a metabolic issue where we're concerned about sugars and starches? That really plays into our choice of forage. <clears throat> and what is the horse's body weight and body condition? Now, body weight will give you um, an estimate, when we estimate the horse's body weight, that dictates how much forage the horse has got to eat. And the body condition will tell us the body fatness of that horse. And then we can make an ideal forage selection from there. So we're going to go backwards. So I said we've got to ask all these questions of ourselves in order to determine the best forage. But for the purposes of today's presentation, I actually want to go to the end and work backwards. So we're going to start by talking about the forages. But before we even get to the forages, there's really the first point that I want to make is that nutritional value does not always equal high quality. <clears throat> it really is dependent on the horse we're feeding and what is the most appropriate forage for that horse. Quality encompasses so many things and not just nutritional profile. It's consistency, it's freshness, is it clean, and is it available to me? All of these criteria go into whether a product is of high quality. <clears throat> and when I mention nutritional value, we'll go through and we'll look at hays that are high in protein and energy uh, and nutrition, and maybe that's of high quality and value to a lactating broodmare, but it isn't ideal for a fat laminitic pony. So nutritional value is what is appropriate for my horse. So we'll go ahead and get started. We'll, we'll start with alfalfa because it's probably one of the most common forages that um, gets misrepresented. Typical alfalfa forage is high in protein, it's high in energy, it's high in calcium. Um, it's moderate in, uh, pro in phosphorus and it's moderate in fiber. <clears throat> low in starch, low in water-soluble carbohydrates and low in ethanol-soluble carbohydrates, which is simple sugars. Now on this slide, we'll go through that terminology just a little bit more so that we understand it going forward. Water-soluble carbohydrates is simply the combination of ethanol-soluble carbohydrates and another plant-based carbohydrate called fructan. Um, and alfalfa is a legume, and we consider legumes to be self-limiting. And self-limiting means that they're not able to store their energy storage unit, which is starch, um, 
there, there's a, say a gas tank, for example, and once it's filled, they have to utilize that energy, i.e. the plant must grow and utilize some of that energy before it can store more. So alfalfa is ideal for the young growing horse because of that high protein. It's got extra calories, but some of the myths that surround protein are well, it makes my horse hot or it makes them crazy or it gives them developmental orthopedic disease. And these things are not true. Uh, and we'll touch on which horses it should be ideal for as we go forward. But let's talk now about Timothy grass forage. <clears throat> Again, another forage that is pretty common most places in the country. And all of these are typical uh, estimates of their nutritional value. It really, it depends on the actual growing conditions as to whether there is going to be a certain amount of new, uh, vitamins and minerals and also the carbohydrates. But at Stanley Western Premium Forage, they really um, have the ideal growing conditions. So every grass that they grow there is grown to its utmost potential. <clears throat> so Timothy, moderate in protein, moderate in energy, lower in calcium and phosphorus, higher in fiber, which can be a, a really good asset, low in starch because it's a grass and it doesn't store its energy as starch, but it's much higher in those water soluble carbohydrates and those sugars in the ethanol soluble carbohydrates. Now we've got this other term here, moderate, RFV, that's relative feed value, that really is a terminology that stems from feeding dairy cattle, where we're looking at um, the palatability and digestibility of these forages. And in cattle, obviously, we're looking for high feed efficiency. We want that RFV value to be really high. That's not always the case, again, with our horses, because let's just say we're feeding a maintenance horse that is overweight then we don't necessarily want to have the most nutritional value. <clears throat> Orchard grass. Orchard grass forage, similar to Timothy, moderate in protein and energy, low in that calcium and phosphorus, higher in fiber, low in starches, but again, can be high in those water-soluble carbohydrates and ethanol-soluble carbohydrates and moderate relative feed value. Now, I have this other final bullet point here that higher in nutrient value compared to Timothy. But again, let's go back to my very first point. That is not a detriment to Timothy. It means if we have a horse that needs a little bit more calories, a little bit more tr nutritional value from the hay so we don't have to feed as much grain, then we're going to lean towards orchard grass compared to Timothy. If we've got a horse that is really maintaining well or is a little overweight, we're going to lean towards more of the Timothy grass uh, um, when we're looking at these two. Now, a new, a new candidate on the block that some of you may be familiar with, um, but it is relatively new, is a warm season grass called Tef. Um, and it, it originates in Asian countries and it's a really fine stemmed um, <clears throat> grass. It's moderate in protein and energy. It's low in calcium and phosphorus. It's high in fiber, low in starch, low in water soluble carbohydrates and low in ethanol soluble carbohydrates. So this is where TEF completely differs from our orchard grass or our Timothy is this low in sugars and fructans. So it's ideal for those horses with metabolic challenges where we have a, sometimes overweight <clears throat> and we need low carbohydrates. TEF is an ideal candidate there. Now, another forage that we thought we should talk about um, is Bermuda grass because again, there is so many myths about Bermuda grass, so many um, uh, concerns about Bermuda grass, but really I'll give you the facts about Bermuda grass. It's a warm season grass, just like Teff, so it typically has very low sugars and starches, but when most people talk about, I can't feed my horse Bermuda grass because it's going to cause impaction colic, they're talking about coastal Bermuda grass. You can see I have just listed some of the varieties of Bermuda grass. 
we've got here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different varieties that I've just listed here. And the issue with coastal is it's very fine in nature, and especially when you dry it, it's really fine. So it doesn't put a lot of pressure on those stretch receptors in the horse's gut. And so motility of the gut can slow down and it can sometimes cause impaction colic. Um, but I have also seen other varieties of Bermuda grass be really high in nutritional value. So don't write off Bermuda grass as uh, something that you cannot feed because there are so many different varieties. But if we're going to focus on coastal, low in protein and energy, low in calcium, phosphorus, very high in fiber, low in starch, water-soluble carbohydrates, and ethanol-soluble carbohydrates, pretty low in that relative forage value. So um, digestibility and palatability are pretty low. But again, the concern with the coastal is it's very fine. And so it's not causing that motility. It's not flowing through the horse's digestive system and can cause impaction colic. So I'm going to uh, throw it over to Katie for a poll question. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt. So our first polling question is, what type of hay do you feed your horse? And the options that we have listed are alfalfa, Timothy grass, orchard grass, teff grass, or any species of Bermuda grass. Uh, these are the ones that we're focusing on. So, um, and this particular question can have multiple answers selected. So choose any that are applicable for you, um, especially if you feed any kind of like alfalfa grass mix forages. Uh, go ahead and select your best choices and click submit. Your specific answer won't be seen by any of the other attendees, uh, but we will go ahead and view the total responses together once the poll closes. So it looks like most of you have voted, but we have a few left. So if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and do that. And we're gonna close the poll. I'm gonna share it with everyone. And Dr. Cubit, we have 61% have selected alfalfa, 46% have selected timothy grass, 54% for orchard grass, 11% for teff grass, and 30% for Bermuda grass. And Fantastic. back over to you. Okay, so we've got a, cr a wide cross section there. So now that we've touched a little bit on the different types of forages, Let's talk about these criteria that we're going to ask ourselves before we select those forages. So what, what's the life stage of this horse? Is it a growing horse, i.e. do we have a foal, birth to weaning, where really they're getting most of their nutrition still from their dam, from their mother, and whatever the mother's eating. But when we take over at weaning, six to 12 months, then we've got, we're concerned with growth of those animals and what is the outcome? Are we doing, looking at fast growth, slow growth? What are we looking at doing with that animal? And then yearlings from 12 to 24 months. So I mentioned rapid, normal, and slow growth. Now, if we've got weanlings that we're looking at selling at weanling sales, so we really need to get them filled out and looking really great, um, we may be encouraging a little faster growth with them. So we're looking for higher protein and energy products. Now, those two nutrients must go hand in hand when we're asking these animals to um, increase their their body condition and body weight and muscle development a little quicker. We need to have protein and energy go hand in hand, just like calcium and phosphorus. So alfalfa products are ideal for these horses. Now it is an absolute myth that high protein causes growth issues in young foals. That has been disproven over and over again, um, <clears throat> but it seems to linger. Uh, you're, you're, if you take away protein, you're going to create more issues is what we've found in research. So we need quality protein um, and couple that with the adequate amount of energy for these horses. Now, if we're just looking at normal growth, we want moderate protein or moderate energy. So we're looking more at the alfalfa, alfalfa mix products <clears throat> or the slower growth. Let's just say we have horses that we're worried about um, them getting too heavy or maybe they've got an injury, then we're going to look at these lower energy uh, in products like grass products. 
the yearling horse, we're looking at the same criteria, rapid growth, normal growth, and slow growth, but now we want to add in some of these yearlings going off to yearling sales are really getting into doing a little bit more exercise because they're prepping for sale. So if we're doing that, let's say we have a yearling that we're, we would like them to have just normal growth, but we're doing some exercise with them, then we're going to feed them once one level up. So again, for rapid growth, we're looking for those alfalfa products because they're giving us beautiful energy and really good quality protein. Um, but for normal growth, we're looking at moderate protein and energy out of our alfalfa mix. But if we're exercising these horses, again, step up to primarily alfalfa, lean more towards the alfalfa. And again, these yearlings that are potentially just growing out in a field, we're looking at just our grass products. <clears throat> All of these recommendations that you can see um, in the green graphics, they're all on our website at the Stanley Forage Finder. I'll show you that on our very last slide. I'll show you a screen capture of that, but know that you don't need to be frantically taking notes. You can type this, your criteria into the Forage Finder and it will give you an ideal match for what you should be feeding your horse. So now let's skip over that mature horse because we'll we'll talk about um, different disciplines, et cetera, and we'll go to the senior horse. And the criteria that we need to be most concerned about with our senior horses are their teeth, do they have good dentition, digestive function is really declining, and their ability to maintain weight. These are the three questions that dictate whether a horse needs to be fed like a senior and it's really not a certain age. Most people think, well, he's turned 20, so he needs a senior feed or I need to feed him like a senior horse. And that's really not true. We've got some horses that are 15 and they've got poor dentition, maybe they've been a rescue case. And then I have other horses that are 30, still have great teeth and don't necessarily need that senior type diet. So Again, let's it, if we've got a senior horse that has no special needs, <clears throat> then typically we're looking at our alfalfa mix products. A fun, another function of aging is they're just losing some of that um, top line, that muscling. So adding the alfalfa is really going to give good quality protein to help with that. If the horse is underweight, the alfalfa products are always our go-to. Why? Higher, higher in energy, i.e. calories and protein that are going to help with that body condition. Across the board, you will see that as a general theme. Underweight horses should be leaning towards the alfalfa products. Overweight horses, we're looking at our grass products in particular Tef, because a lot of times our overweight horses, we're also concerned about carbohydrate sensitivities. Now, if we get down into carbohydrate sensitivities, we really break that into two sections too. Is the horse underweight? If yes, we're going to lean towards our alfalfa or alfalfa mix products. If the horse is overweight, then we're leaning towards Tef. All of these forages are low in sugars and starches. It's just then are they giving a lot of energy or are we a little less in energy? Teeth issues, then we're looking at alfalfa or alfa, alfalfa mix products. And we also want to look at the um, actual form of these ingredients and they should be pelleted or cubed so that you can wet them and make a mash for that horse. So let's look at the physiological stage or use. Is it a maintenance horse? So it's just literally out in the field grazing or not doing any exercise? Or is it a performance horse? And there are a slew of different disciplines. Um, or is it a breeding horse, a broodmare? And is she pregnant or lactating? There really is no higher demand on a horse than a, a mare in early, just, in early lactation. Or is a stallion in the breeding or, or non-breeding season? <clears throat> of these disciplines, now by no means do I have all of the disciplines here, but we've got, you know, a cross section on this slide of, of dressage and trail riding and harness racing and show jumping and barrel racing and other Western disciplines, flat racing, gated horses. I mean, we could have 10 different slides all just looking at different disciplines we do with horses. But really that maintenance horse doing no exercise or even a horse that's doing light exercise but is a really easy keeper, we're looking um, at that uh, – grass-based products, low energy, low protein. If the horse is underweight and not doing any exercise, again, we're looking at the alfalfa products, overweight, 
we're looking at TEF, carbohydrate sensitive, alfalfa products if underweight, TEF if overweight. And we'll throw in another one, this HYPP, hyperkalemic peri periodic paralysis, which we see in quarter horses um, that cannot stand having excess potassium in the diet. So we're going to steer away from alfalfa and go with our grass-based products. So <clears throat> let's just look at a performance horse. They're actively being ridden or shown. And now within each discipline, there are obviously different levels, light, moderate, and heavy exercise. Uh, and, and you need to take that into account. But we're looking now at more moderate energy and protein products like our alfalfa mix products. Horses that are underweight, again, we're going towards those alfalfa products. Overweight, we're looking at grass, uh, the TEF products. And <clears throat> one of the issues, the syndromes that really um, plagues our performance horses is gastric ulcers. And <clears throat> the alfalfa products are high in calcium, and that can act as a really natural buffer to that stomach acid and be a really ideal. So even if you do have a horse that's a little on the heavier side, if you can just put in a small amount of alfalfa, it's really going to help um, buffering that stomach acid. We primarily recommend that um, if you're only going to do it once a day, just prior to exercise. So when you're tacking up, you could feed a couple of handfuls of alfalfa while you're tacking up. Now, pregnancy or lactation, early pregnancy, really, you're just like a, ma a maintenance horse, grass-based products. Um, late pregnancy, five months to term, we're looking at our alfalfa, alfalfa mix products because now we're laying down more tissue and, and fat and we're needing more of the energy and protein. Early lactation, there is no time where a horse has more requirements than in early lactation. And that's when we're looking at our alfalfa products. Late lactation, it's alfalfa mixed products or even um, uh, grass-based products if the mare is a really good producer of milk. Our stallion, if he's not in the breeding season, low protein and low energy, so our grass-based products. But when he's actively breeding, he has about a 25% higher requirement. So it's about this equivalent to light exercise. Um, so again, we're looking at our alfalfa mix products. If you have a stallion that really doesn't do well over the whole breeding season and needs to gain some weight, then go lean more towards the alfalfa products. Now the poll question. Thank you, Dr. Cubit. So our second polling question is, have you owned or cared for a horse that has laminitis, tying up syndrome, insulin resistance, or any other type of metabolic disorder? And the options are yes, that you previously have, no, you haven't, or currently, meaning that you currently are feeding or owning uh, a, a horse that has a metabolic disorder of a sort. So go ahead and select your options and click submit. And about 79% of you have voted, so we'll wait for a few more to come in before we close the poll. Perfect, okay, we're gonna close the poll and share the results with everyone. So 43% have said yes, they have cared for a horse or owned a horse that has a metabolic disorder. 32% have said no, and 24% have said that they currently are feeding a horse that has a metabolic disorder. Okay, okay, so everybody's got a bit of experience here. So let's look at these diagnosed medical issues and what we should be feeding. Um, and primarily where we talked about the gastric ulcers earlier, but um, if your horse is underweight, you don't really need a medical diagnosis to tell if your horse is underweight, uh, but our alfalfa products there, overweight uh, grass products, carbohydrate sensitivities, we talked about that a little earlier, either alfalfa products if they're underweight or grass products, TEF, if they're overweight, and then our HYPP, we want to avoid any alfalfa-based products because it's too much potassium and lean towards our grass-based products. Um, so we need to we need to ask about the horse's body weight or body condition. Now, not everybody has 
uh, a scale available to them. Maybe your local veterinarian has a scale that you can use, but it's not commonplace for farms to have a scale. Uh, we can use a weight tape, uh, as you can see in the lady in the pink sweaters using a weight tape on her horse. But these can be consistently anywhere from 150 to 250 pounds off. So it's a good way to measure changes in body weight, but not actual body weight. There's also this simple equation that you can use, which is the girth times the girth times the length, all in inches, divided by 330. And that will give you a better estimation of body weight. Um, so the the length measurement is from the point of the shoulder to the point of the buttock and the girth measurement is really exactly where you would do the weight tape measurement um, so that is a good way to estimate body weight now body condition obviously is looking at the body fatness because body weight isn't going to tell us anything about how fat our horse is um, and body condition this is a body score of one overall you can see the ribs you can see all the bones the horse is emaciated and he's probably got terrible hair coat and is feeling pretty depressed a thin horse you can start to see a little bit more coverage but I can still clearly visibly see the ribs um, and all of his bones protruding but he seems to be a little bit more uh, lively a horse that is a three, body condition score of three. Now, ideally, you should be palpating your ho these horses, putting your hands on them. You can see there's a little bit more even coverage, but I can still very clearly see the ribs, and I don't really see a lot of top line on that horse. Now, a four. Four is where we start to get into the gray area because there are a lot of endurance horses or event horses or race horses that this may be, may be peak racing condition for them, but this is going to be difficult to get a broodmare pregnant if she's in this body condition. So this is kind of a gray area, but still for most of our horses, I would consider this thin. A five or a six is ideal. Now here we've got a, a thoroughbred and even coverage all over. We don't see any bones protruding, but if I pressed on the ribs, for example, I wouldn't have to press too hard to feel the ribs. And then here we've got a quarter horse and I, I show these two different um, phenotypes because you can see their body structure is different but they're still very similar in their body condition so a five and six are ideal and seven is where we again get into the other side of that gray area seven we're starting to get uh, heavier and this horse carries more of his weight in his forehand but he's got a lot more fat pads right here where that big white splash is you start to see the wither is sinking in because we have a lot more body fat over his top line here a body condition score of eight and we've really got a lot more fat coverage over it's kind of hard to see in this picture but at, at this horse's hindquarter there's actually some folds in the skin uh, right above his uh, stifle and you can see right where you would do the girth up he's quite fat over his tail head he's got some fatness and then his, his withers are really sunken in because there's big fat pads on either side but finally a body condition score of nine and this horse is quite obese um, right behind his shoulder there's a big fat pad you really can't see his wither because it's sunken in there's two big fat pads he's got a huge crusty neck his uh, above his tail head he's got two big fat pads he's most likely got a really fatty sheath and the um, occipital divot over his eyeball here is most likely um, bulging out as well so hand it over for another poll question thank you dr cubit so this is a little surprise in here for you. We actually threw in one more poll question because we were curious to know, uh, and this is just a reminder that uh, your specific answer isn't going to be shown, so feel free to answer um, honestly, but do you feel confident body condition scoring your horse? The options are yes, no, or I do now, if this presentation so far has helped you when you previously didn't feel comfortable. So go ahead and um, answer as honestly as you can and cl click submit. About 78% have voted, so we'll give you just a few more seconds to get the rest in there before we close the poll. Okay, we will close this up and share the results with everyone. So 68% have said yes, they are confident in body condition scoring their horse. 25% uh, do feel much more confident now after uh, listening into the presentation and 7% still are struggling a little bit. 
Um, and I will throw in, if you guys do have any questions that come up that we aren't able to answer in the webinar, please reach out to us. That's what we're here for. We want to make sure that we're um, serving you the best that we can so you can take care of your animals. So, Dr. Cubitt. Thanks, Katie. And and really, I specifically wanted to ask that question about body condition scoring your horses because it is difficult. And I go to a lot of farms where maybe people are very familiar with looking at a quarter horse type body and then they see a thoroughbred and think it's really thin. And then I look at the thoroughbred and say, no, he's in ideal body condition. So it can be really challenging to body condition score horses. And you really have to take into account the whole body um, sometimes we have horses, their back starts to sway a little as they age. So I, I'm glad that a lot of people feel confident. Um, so again, our underweight horses, we're looking at alfalfa products and our overweight horses, we're looking at feeding our TEF based products. Finally, we've got to get down to how much is absolutely critical for our horses. Well, a bare minimum is 1% of their body weight. Now that is to avoid sickness. That is not to keep your horse healthy. That is just to avoid sickness. So um, it'll keep his gut functioning, but we really want to feed more than that. If I have an overweight horse and I actively have them on a weight loss program, I typically feed about 1.2% of their body weight. Now that's about 12 pounds of forage per day, which can be quite restrictive. And we need to make sure that we're breaking it up. So we're still mimicking grazing behavior. But typically I like to see our horses eating between one and a half to two and a half percent of their body weight in dry forage per day. So um, that can be anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds of forage. The less forage you feed, the more intensely you have to manage it because we really don't want our horses having more than two hours without something to consume. Otherwise, we really start to increase our risk for gastric ulcers. So in summary, we need to answer these questions honestly, and we need to choose forages based on individuals. We need to feed enough forage and again, it's, it's sometimes very daunting. For example, I live in the east coast of the country and alfalfa is not that easy to come by. But what is fantastic is Stanley Western Premium Forage is available all over the country and all you need to do is go on the website, click find a store and you'll find a retailer close to you. So uh, that's a really great quality aspect to the Stanley products is that they're available. Um, so with that, this is the store locator that we were mentioning. If you go on the website, you can find the store. You can see the button right beside that is the forage finder, which is what I was mentioning throughout the presentation. If you have a different horse or you want to play with that and look at what forage it might dip, uh, uh, recommend. Now, if you ever got any questions, you can obviously contact us directly. But with that, oh, I think I clicked on the website. Whoa, man. It took us to the website because it was a fantastic presentation. <laughs> we will ask questions. There you go. Um, Dr. Cupid, would you mind jumping back just really for a quick minute on that last slide that you yes. had? I also want to point out, um, for those of you who are unaware, uh, you'll see below there that we have four-star dealers that are listed. Um, if you don't know who those are, they have that, that four-star dealer approved. A seal that's listed next to them. Basically, it tells you that these are the retail stores that kind of have gone above and beyond to carry a wide selection of products of Stanley's. Um, so you know going into their store that there's going to be, you know, a variety of pellets, cubes, chopped, um, some compressed bales uh, and treats, things like that. And they also have taken the initiative to do extra training to really understand uh, forage and the importance of it in a horse's diet and what type of forage might be more ideal for certain horses. Uh, and then another fun little thing that I wanted to share with you, especially for all of you ha who have taken the time to jump on here and listen into the webinar, if you go to that coupon section, we actually have a coupon out right now for our horse pill carriers, um, which is $4 off. So if you're looking for coupons, that's one that you're not going to want to miss. If you haven't tried the horse pill carriers yet, uh, go ahead and go 
go get that coupon and grab some because if you struggle with medicating your horses, this just might be the solution for you. So check that out too. And let's go ahead and jump into questions. So thank you, Dr. Cubit. You have shared a lot of great insight to us on a variety of different forage types and you know what horses they ideally fit for. I also want to remind you guys that we do have those three files available under handouts to download those before we end the webinar and we will we are still looking to do a drawing for a winner of free product coupons at the end so if you stick with us through these questions we'll uh, we'll do that so our first question is um dr cubit from Donna and Donna would like to know, my horse is at a community stable. I can't test the hay to find its nutritional value. How do I know what supplements he may need and how do they change over the year with different cuts of hay? Oh, wow. Okay. So we could spend a whole nother presentation talking about that. And really, um, it's very difficult to determine 100% nutritional value without testing the hay. And I, if you're, if the community stable you're at gets large quantities of hay at a time, uh, really to do a hay test to get the numbers that you need, it's only about $25. So uh, if they're getting a lot of hay in, I would recommend that you encourage them to test it or ask if you could test it. But um, typically our first cut hays uh, are going to be higher in that non-digestible fiber. And the reason is it's the springtime, depending on where you live in the country where that hay is being cut, it can be quite wet. So it takes us a while to get out onto the field with the machinery to cut the grass. And so the grass gets is standing longer, so it gets more mature and is contains more of that non-digestible fiber. So that's why a lot of people will say that first cutting hay, some horses don't like it because it's not that palatable. Some people with overweight horses will always lean towards it because um, they don't consume it as quickly and it doesn't seem to put as much body weight on them. When it comes to sugars and starches, first cut, second cut, third cut, you cannot tell. It is all dependent on the growing conditions. As far as nutritional value, again, I can't tell you how much copper or zinc is in the grass depending on um, first cut, second cut, or even region it was grown. That comes down to fertility in the soil. Um, <clears throat> protein level and energy level are typically going to be uh, higher in a less mature grass. So a second, third cut grass is going to be higher in those. Um, but a alfalfa, a legume, is always going to be higher in, in those protein and energy. So uh, I, that was a tough one. And seasonally, as you store forages, the only thing they're losing is vitamin A and vitamin E. They're not going to lose protein or, ca or copper or they're, they're going to stay pretty standard um, there as long as they don't get moldy or weathered. Um, seasonally, if you're getting hay from a local supplier, then it's going to be um, probably our cool season and warm season grasses. So in the spring and fall, we'll have um, probably an influx in sugars and starches compared to in, in the summer. But without a hay test, it's really hard, sorry. Great, okay, thank you. Um, good question, Donna. And our next question is from Suzanne. And Suzanne would like to know, I have a 20 year old forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, but Tabiano Gelding that has been diagnosed with photosensitivity. Before I got him, he had a major episode and has been left with large hairless scars on both of his shoulders. He is used as a lower level dressage horse and has worked four to five days a week. We bail Tifton hay and he is on that year round. However, he tends to lose condition in the winter. I have been told he can't have alfalfa. I am in Florida and very limited in what is available around here, but what would be the best hay for him? Um, well, I, I'm not quite sure why they would say that he couldn't have the alfalfa um, unless there's some kind of autoimmune issue where they're concerned about uh, protein content, which I, I still can't imagine why. Uh, they would not want out him to feed alpha, eat alfalfa. That to me would be ideal because it's higher in calories, so it's going to help him maintain his body weight. Um, but 
if you're limited on your hay and the Tifton's all that you uh, can get access to, then you can always buy um, some, say, Timothy or orchard grass pellets, and you can always add a little oil to, um, to those products as well to get some extra calories. Good. Um, what do you think about beet pulp? Is that something that would be beneficial for Suzanne in this case? Absolutely. It's not necessarily a hay, but it's certainly right. a fiber right. source. Yes. It's certainly a fiber source, and okay. it's a highly yeah. digestible fiber source. Okay, excellent. Um, Brittany would like to know how much alfalfa for a senior horse. And so this horse has moderate dentition, some difficulty, difficulty maintaining weight, some muscle wasting. Do pellets versus flakes matter? Um, now, the if he's got mild uh, dental issues, then certainly a combination of pellets and, and long stem forage is good because we want to make sure that he's getting all the nutrition he can. But the problem when we have to go to 100% pelleted forage is they do consume that very quickly. Uh, and so we need to manage that a lot more to increase chewing and increase saliva production, et cetera. So I would do a combination of both because he's still got some teeth. Um, and so mental health wise, it's always better to feed a long stem hay, but um, adding in some of that pelleted forage will also ensure that he's, he's consuming enough and getting enough nutrition out of it. Nice. Okay. So if there's moderate dentition there, do you think there would be any kind of benefit with cubes versus pellets in that case? Or how would that work for Brittany? <laughs> to me, cubes versus pellets is more of a personal preference. I think that um, the digestibility difference is is negligible. There, there is no digestibility difference between long stem hay or pellets or cubes as far as in the gut being digestible. It all right. comes down to how much the horse can tolerate. And typically with any kind of dental issues, we're going to be wetting that. So it's degrading mm -hmm. anyway. So nice. Okay. Good. Okay. Hopefully that helped you a little bit, Brittany. So our next question is from Kim and Kim would like to know how do chemical fertilizers affect nutritional value of the forages discussed here? <clears throat> well, fertilizers are going to put nutrients into the soil and then the plant is going to absorb those nutrients up into their their leaves and stems and be able to supply that to the horse. So um, really we want that active growing plant, an active growing plant does not have high sugars and starches because they're utilizing that sugar and starch. So when I talk about um, how to decrease sh carbohydrates or sugars and starches in a forage, you want to make sure that that forage has um, ideal temperature overnight because overnight is when they're going to grow. When the sun is not shining on them, that's when plants grow. So we want the right temperature, we want enough soil fertility, and we want a lot, enough moisture in the soil. And those plants will actively grow and utilize all those sugars and starches. Um, and therefore you just have a, a nutrient dense grass that isn't high in sugars and starches. Now, if it's cold, frosty at night, or it's a drought conditions, or we've got really poor fertility in the soil, the plant won't actively grow. Um, so you're going to have plants that are pretty high in sugars and starches when you don't have good soil fertility. Okay. Susan would like to know, does cribbing and forage have any correlation? Absolutely. Yes. Great question. Um, cribbing is often a result of a pain response. Um, and sometimes it's that they're, uh, trying to release those endorphins because it can be a learned behavior, but oftentimes it is overcoming some kind of gastrointestinal pain, gastric ulcers, for example. So um, you may get a horse that's 15 and that has the previous owner says, well, he's cribbed for the last 10 years. And at that point, no amount of forage is going to fix it because that's now become a learned behavior. But if you 
can catch it before, right in those first few months of what's starting, because it always starts somewhere, then it usually starts because we've got some pain going on. And so perhaps those horses weren't getting enough forage. So absolutely feeding enough forage can decrease our risk for these horses picking up these terrible stereotypes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Leah, Leah, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, is bird's foot trefoil a good hay? Is it comparable to alfalfa? I give my horse this with the alfalfa products. Uh, not necessarily comparable to alfalfa. Um, it is also a, a legume, so it's higher in those um, protein and, and energy, but not quite, not not as good as uh, alfalfa, but not but not bad. Okay. Christy would like to know, what about feeding a combination of orchard, alfalfa, and coastal? When stalled, my horses have a mix of orchard, alfalfa, and timothy, but when out in pasture, they have access to coastal round bale, which has a slow feed net on it. I just want to make sure feeding the combination will not cause any problems. Feeding the combination is the best way to do it because, because coastal is really fine, and as I said, it doesn't press on the stretch receptors in the digestive tract that cause those peristaltic contractions that push the forage through, um, then adding in some, some other forages like alfalfa or orchard grass that do have more, um, more density, more fibrous matter that is more, got some more stem structure there that's going to actually push on the digestive tract. Then that is, if, if people are going to add coastal to the diet, then I always say, add it to a grass that's got more substance. So yes, that's the best way to do it. Okay. Let's see, Susan would like to know, is beet pulp bad for growing horses? No, beet pulp is not bad for any horse except a fat horse because it is higher in calories. It's very highly digestible. A lot of people use it for weight gain, um, but it is not bad for a young horse. Okay. Stephanie would like to know, how do you prevent enteroliths caused by feeding too much protein or alfalfa? Enteroliths, number one, are not caused by feeding too much protein or alfalfa. They are a mineral uh, buildup it, that encapsulate some kind of foreign body that was in, um, consumed. Could be a stick, could be a piece of string, uh, could be a rock. And these minerals build up around and around and around, causing these uh, stone-like deposits in the gastrointestinal tract. It is not caused by excess protein. It is caused by excess minerals. You see it a lot more on the West Coast than you do on the East Coast, because you have a lot more mineral content in the water and in the soils. Um, you need to make sure that in those areas, because alfalfa is higher in calcium and does have more mineral content that you're giving your horses plenty of water and that they're actually consuming plenty of water. So adding, if you're in an area where intraliths are more common and you like to feed alfalfa for the, you know, pro energy and, and body maintenance, then I would be making sure your horses have access to salt every day and maybe even adding salt to the diet, but it's not protein causing intraliths. Okay, that is good to know, and thank you for bringing that up, Stephanie. We actually had, from what I've noticed, we've had one other person mention that, so that was a good question, and thank you, Dr. Cubitt, for uh, for clearing that up. That was that was good to know. Let's see. I think we're going to have time for, depending on how long it is, one or two more questions. So let's look at Sam would like to know. We travel a lot trail riding. We live in Oklahoma, so Bermuda is our pasture and brown bales. I also feed some alfalfa in the evenings, one flake each, but when we travel, I run into areas where they feed orchard and timothy because they do not have Bermuda. Do you worry about change of forage with colic in these instances? Good question. 
Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And most people know that you don't make rapid feeding changes. And we, we associate that to grains. But absolutely, um, we should be always cautious of making rapid forage changes as well. Because if you look at most horses are going to get about an 80-20 ratio of forage to grain. 20% of their diet is going to be grain and 80% of their diet is forage. So a small change in the nutrients coming from the fiber is actually exponential because you're feeding such a large quantity of the diet coming from forage. So <clears throat> what type of Bermuda are you feeding? Because depending on the type of Bermuda grass that you're feeding at home, then it may be more similar in nutritional profile to uh, a timothy or an orchard grass and it's really only the coastal that has that finer stem as well i want to point that out um, these other varieties have been bred to have a thicker stem a more substantial stem um, so it, it can be challenging making these changes and so it's always good if you can to to carry some of your forages or even knowing when you're going into those areas buy some alfalfa or some Timothy pellets at home and add them in. T pellets, it's still going to uh, adapt those microbes in the hindgut to that type of fiber. It doesn't necessarily have to be long stem fiber. So if you're not, you, you know you're going into an area where you can't get coastal and your horses are going to have to eat some Timothy and it'll be Timothy long stem hay, you know that you can go to um, a, a numerous different distributors and get some Stanley Timothy pellets, start them on that, start, add that into the diet before you go, uh, and that will help transition while you're away. But yeah, it's a great question, and it, and it is a big challenge for people that travel around, and, and a lot of the people that are sponsored by uh, Stanley, that is one of the, the big things that they love about it is that they can get the same quality forage anywhere in the country because these big top riders they do they go all over the country thank you so we're actually we have a lot of questions that are in i know we can't get to them all but um because of that i want to throw in one more question um so Lori would like to know are supplements such as vitamin e and magnesium necessary when feeding quality forage um the, vitamin e uh oftentimes yes um so if we go back to where do horses get vitamin E, vitamin E horses get from fresh green grass. Now, the and they have to eat it for 17 hours out of the day, and that's going to give them about enough for a maintenance horse. So as we're exercising horses, doing heavy exercise, they're going to require more vitamin E. And if we're putting them in stalls and feeding them shed and stored forages, then they're not getting enough vitamin E. Most of the vitamin E is depleted out of that forage within the first um, one to two weeks. Uh, now, we have done some tests with the Stanley forage, and because uh, Stanley, so it's the UV light that actually breaks down and denatures that vitamin E. So if you can get that hay cut, baled immediately, and then covered and out of the light, then you can extend the, the life shelf life of some of that vitamin E. And so we have been able to do vitamin E tests on some of the Stanley alfalfa products and find that they do have a higher vitamin E than other products. But if you're doing heavy exercise or you know that your horse has some vitamin E deficiencies, then potentially, yes, you still might have to uh, supplement with vitamin E. Now, as far as magnesium, your horse is probably not gonna get all the magnesium it needs out of forage, but you've got to be feeding a vitamin mineral supplement or, or balancer or something with hay. You're, it doesn't matter how brilliant the hay is, you're most likely not going to have enough selenium in the hay either. So there are other minerals that we need to complement uh, in the hay. So a, a basic vitamin mineral supplement or a ration balancer will complement any hay. Okay. But individual Thanks. supplementation of specific nutrients other than something like vitamin E. I think I recommend more going towards a complete supplement. Okay, good. All right, that is going to wrap up our Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Cubit, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time and interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. Um, Dr. Cubit, if you wouldn't mind going it going ahead and sliding over to the next slide for us. 
Uh, one more thing that I would like to share with you all before we select a winner, I'll try to make this brief, but this is something that's very personal and drives what we do every day here at Stanley. It celebrates you and all of us that have a great passion for the lifestyle that we live. At one point in time, a seed was planted for you. And this seed is what grew and made you into the person you are today. Your first moment, your first experience that led you to a lifestyle devoted to your horses and other livestock, wanting to give them the best that you have to offer when in reality, they've given you so much more than you could ever give them. So whether it was the very moment you laid eyes on your heart horse and you just felt that connection that makes you one being, or maybe you had no back ag background at all, but a friend introduced you to 4-H or FFA and they let you keep your pig or lamb at their place so you'd be able to participate. There are so many untold stories that deserve to be heard and celebrated. And here on our last slide, you'll see right there in the middle, we have a link to a blog post asking to hear your stories. And on that page also, we invite you to go and visit it. It shares this beautiful video that was created to celebrate you and your lifestyle. It, it seriously gives me chills every time I watch it. And I think mainly because it tells a part of my history as well, my story growing up in agriculture. So share that moment your seed was planted where you were grown for the life you love. We wanna hear all about it. So we invite you to go check that out and um, tell us your story. So like I promised, before we wrap this up, we're gonna announce our winner of free product coupons. And I know we went a little bit longer today. You guys have asked so many good questions. You've been so patient with us that I'm actually going to select two winners. So this is just our way of saying thank you for being on here with us and just caring so much for your animals. And the winner, I'm gonna apologize because I've grown up my entire life having my name butchered. Star is my maiden name, is not my maiden name, it's my married name, so. But the winners are Mary Mulliet and Tom Bauman. Again, Tom and Mary, if I butchered your name, I do apologize, but I do wanna congratulate you because you guys are our winners for the free product coupons. I will reach out to you and get your email addresses. So uh, I will reach out via email so we can get your mailing addresses and get those sent out to you. But if you guys have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, I know we had some that came through that we didn't have time for, please contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available here on this final slide. You can find past webinars, more nutritional white papers, and other great information, including the Stanley Barn Bulletin blog, and some great tools to help identify what type of forage is best for your horse, which we discussed today with the Forage Finder, and how to optimize their diet with the feed calculator on our website at stanleyforage.com. Some of our previous webinar presentations have included beet pulp, what is it, and why do horses need it? When quality hay is in short supply, what can I feed my horse? Should I be concerned about feeding alfalfa? And many other great topics. We have done a number of different webinars over the last few years. So please check those recordings out on our website if you have previously missed them. When you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would really appreciate if you could complete that for us. Your feedback helps us create better webinars for you and better content um, to help us identify some great topics for future webinars as well. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. If you'd like to go back and reference uh, the information that was in it, we talked about a lot of things today. The recording should be available for about a week following today's webinar and then available on our website under nutritional resources. And one other thing that I'd like to note, I know we talked about teff grass hay uh, with you today. Um, this is this, a little bit of a teaser for you just to kind of bring awareness is um, we currently do not have 
tough grass, but it will be out very shortly. So if this is a product that you think is going to be really beneficial for your horse, um, join our email list um, because we'll be letting you know when it's going to be available for you to get. It's going to be in early 2020. So um, I just want to make sure if some of you were wondering, you know, we're talking about TEF so much, but you don't see it on the website or anything like that. That is why. Um, so join our email list. We'll keep you guys up to date and in the know and give you any kind of educational content that you need on it. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubit, Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.